This episode is brought to you by Choiceology, an original podcast from Charles Schwab. Hosted by Katie Milkman, an award-winning behavioral scientist and author of the best-selling book, How to Change, Choiceology is a show about the psychology and economics behind our decisions. Hear true stories from Nobel laureates, authors, athletes, and more about why we do the things we do. Listen to Choiceology at schwab.com slash podcast or wherever you listen. I just wonder if other justices on the court are going, Clarence, hey, uh, you, you sold us a bill of goods on this thing. I, I'm very curious about this. The legal and medical frameworks of thinking about this are inherently incompatible. Like, you don't talk in medicine, you never learn in medical school or residency how to assess how much someone is dying and whether or not it warrants intervention. If someone is dying at all, you do something about it. Hi, and welcome back to Amicus. This is Slate's podcast about the law and the U.S. Supreme Court. And I'm Dahlia Lithwick. I cover those things for Slate. It's been a little bit of a whirlwind week for me with the paperback launch of my book, Lady Justice. Thank you all for the kind words, the support for my little pink book about the law that is also actually about the big, big ways that women plus the law equals magic. And thank you so much for chatting about it in your book clubs and for giving it to law students. I appreciate it. In addition to the book launch, this week we are trying to wrap our heads around the start of a brand new term, which is coming at us hard now. For those of us who have been imagining better, more comprehensive ways to think about the high court. Connecting the threads of judicial friendships with billionaire donors and Leonard Leo's golden spigot into the cases that eventually get to the docket. One thing we just keep obsessing about is this. What are the long-term consequences of cases that are closed with finality as the justices render opinions in June, exiting the consciousness of court watchers, but that continue to reverberate in very real lives in very real ways? So to tee up this week's show, we wanted to think about a pair of issues that are probably coming back to the high court this term, issues ostensibly resolved conclusively and for all time, only two short terms ago, where what was dangerous and unpopular in the summer of 2022 may soon be rendered much worse by the Supreme Court. The first is, of course, abortion. If the court dockets a massive case appealing the monumental decision to withdraw and modify FDA approval of mifepristone, one of two abortion medications, the Fifth Circuit's ruling is now on hold and the court has to decide whether to grant cert. Later on in the show, we're going to look at the fallout post Dobbs from the eyes of physicians, hospitals, providers, and those scrambling to make sense of what kind of care they can deliver. And we are also going to look at one other issue that is resurfacing at SCOTUS this fall, and that is guns. The court has calendared a case called Rahimi for November, and that case rests on the proposition that the decision in Bruin two years ago, which created a new history-based test for gun regulations, means that a man convicted for possessing a gun while subject to a domestic violence restraining order was unlawfully convicted. Because, historically, as we all know, domestic violence, not a thing. We're going to talk about how the NRA and other gun rights groups and the Second Amendment itself went hopelessly off the rails with someone who believed deeply in the Second Amendment until the radicals took hold of it and wrecked it for everyone. For Slate Plus members, we're also going to have our regular briefing with Mark Joseph Stern talking about news that just dropped from ProPublica about Clarence Thomas and his good friends, the Koch brothers, and their good friends who paid good money to hang out with Clarence Thomas, all of which happened at an exclusive men-only Lord of the Flies camp for wealthy white guys. We're also going to talk about a stunning new decision out of Texas determining that drag performances no longer constitute protected free expression. 
If you are not a Slate Plus member, but you'd like to listen in to our Bohemian Grove Rhapsody and other Behind the Velvet Rope exclusive content, head over to slate.com slash amicus plus for details. And to our Slate Plus members, thank you for your support. But first, Ryan Bussey has lived his whole entire life as a devotee of both firearms and the Second Amendment. He was given guns as gifts when he was a kid. He hunted with his family, still hunts with his kids. And all of this led to his job at the gun manufacturer Kimber that lasted for over 25 years as he became a senior executive in the firearm industry. And in his 2021 book, Gunfight, My Battle Against the Industry That Radicalized America, Ryan detailed why he was, in some ways, leaving the big gun industry because the industry had left him. Since then, he has written a whole lot about the kind of tectonic shift that the court's 2022 ruling in the Bruin case has brought about and has written an awful lot about what is to come if the court and the gun industry continue to pull in the direction they're pulling as public opinion pulls in the opposite direction. I'm not sure there is anyone better situated to help explain what happened with the firearms industry, what its end game is, and what is at stake for us if the court just continues to hand it wins. So Ryan Bussey is an environmental activist. He's a senior advisor for Giffords, which is a gun violence prevention group led by Gabby Gifford. And he has also just thrown his hat in to become the next governor of the great state of Montana. So, Ryan, that was quite a wind up, but welcome to Amicus. That has to be the longest intro you've ever done. Um, thank you so much <laughs> for having me here. Um, really an honor for me. Huge fan of your podcast. It's great. And I think it's really important stuff. So happy to answer any questions. So I think I want to start kind of where I started the intro, which is, I want to be super clear, you are not a guy who hates guns. <laughs> you are not a guy who hates people who love guns. You are not a person who wants to repeal the Second Amendment. When your book came out in 2021, I think you told the New York Times, quote, I don't like guns any less than I did or any more than I did. I shoot with my boys. I hunt every chance I get. I still own guns. Many of the best parts of my life have been centered around guns or using guns. And then you say, I haven't changed. The radical shift in the gun industry is responsible. So I want to really give you time to, like, in the most fulsome way, help us to understand how this industry created, didn't just arm, but created the sort of young white male shooter out there who thinks there's no social problem that cannot be solved with an AR-15 or three. As you mentioned, I grew up on a very rural ranch and farm. Many of the best days of my life were spent with guns. You know, I hunting and shooting with my dad. It was a very healthy to me, wholesome Americana thing. And I'll say right up front, I think a lot of, um, I, I don't mean to be pejorative, but I say like coastal liberals, right? That's I, I know that sounds pejorative, but we've sort of lost touch with how so many people in flyover country um, you know, people scratch their heads like, how can they be so attached to guns? Well, they become a cultural symbol for people because many, many of the best parts of people like me, our lives have been spent with guns. They become a symbol. And of course, they're immensely powerful and all the other things. But after I graduated from college, I got into the firearms industry and it was like a dream job for me, kind of like a kid playing baseball, getting, getting into the major leagues. And um, it wasn't long before I figured out that I was really... I really became distressed because the industry I was in, I felt like wasn't just an industry. It was a it was creating tectonic cultural shifts in our country. And now so many of the things that we see, so many of the chasms that are in our in our political and cultural and, you know, everyday family lives um, can't talk to your neighbors and family members um, hate other family members over politics. Like I saw that all happening 10 or 15 years before in the firearms industry, I saw the creation of that, how hatred and fear and conspiracy theory could be captured, woven into these cultural symbols, like I discussed, 
and then um, put on steroids and create, you know, sort of political shifts. And, you know, now we see that's why I think now you see on the right, every single domestic terror group, Oath Keepers, guns in the logo, Proud Boys, guns in the logo, Three Percenters, guns in the logo. So guns and gun radicalization have become the centerpiece, sadly for me, because I am a hunter and I am, um, I consider myself a responsible gun owner and there are millions of us like that. But the gun culture has been hijacked by very loud, vociferous people who are very effective at changing our culture. And um, yes, guns and, and, and the gun industry, sadly, are right in the middle of it. And I, I want to ask you to unpack the shift. And I'm going to ask you to do that in part by describing, I think you say your wife uses the word complicity, right? Like this is a complicated thing because there is a huge amount of time, it seems to me, in which, you know, you convince yourself that, you know, Kimber, which is kind of a bespoke gun company, is different. It's the Tiffany's of the gun industry. And I think, uh, you know, even as you're sensing the, the norms are changing, and I wanted you to talk explicitly about how the norms change, but also I think you you rise up all the way to vice president of sales and believing that you can make change from the inside, believing that it does more good for the country if you are inside trying to resist these pulls. And I just think like that kind of layered question of how long you stay in and try to make change from inside and at what point you say, this is nuts, I'm out. Can you answer both the question of the shift you saw and how you sort of located yourself in it? I uh, let's just say I have a lot of sympathy for the never Trump Republicans who thought they could stay inside the system and change the system from within. Um, I'm I'm quite quite critical of a lot of them, but I but I can also see why you stay inside a White House and say if I don't stay here and do this, who the hell is going to do it? I did feel a bit like that. The system changed around me so radically that, and I, and I think pertinent to your podcast, it really centers on the way the interpretation of the Second Amendment changed inside our industry. Pre Heller, the entire industry, which and, and I know folks on your podcast are are uh, law geeks here, but let's pre Heller, the there was no established in law right to personal ownership of guns, right? It was thought to be collective ownership. And I'm using broad, you know, non, non-legalistic terms here. Heller essentially established the right to personal ownership of firearms. That started a shift inside the industry from one that, that sort of knew it had to uphold the social compact because the law allowed or constitutional law allowed um, the imposition of regulations across the country. So the industry, for all intent and purposes, would say, well, we better be responsible. We better do the right thing because if we screw up when we do irresponsible stuff, somebody in some state or town or city, whatever, is going to impose laws on us. So as the interpretation of the Constitution started to change, responsibility kind of leached out of the industry because there was no stopgap legal regulatory structure that could be imposed on it. Then when Bruin happened last year, uh, just a day separated from Dobbs and the same originalist constitutional reasoning, well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll uh, reserve the four letter words I have for some of the, for some of the reasoning that Clarence Thomas uses. And, um, it appears to me like it's a freshman, uh, history paper, not a, uh, not a Supreme court decision. But, um, when that was imposed, when that sort of, um, the reasoning was imposed, then another sort of regulatory stopgap was removed. And so you went from an industry who once thought the Second Amendment said, we can own guns, we love it, we want to sell guns, but we have to be responsible because we basically balance the right of public safety with our constitutional right. Now, many on the leading edge of uh, the firearms industry and the advocacy groups around it, which are far more radical than the NRA, believe no. You must own a gun to prepare for violent civil war. You must own it to shoot federal bureaucrats when they come marching down the street. You, so you see, it's gone from this social compact thing to you must do this to prepare for civil war. And that's, that's just the same way our political system has been radicalized. So talk for a minute about you often use the ads 
as a template for describing this shift, right? What what an ad for a gun company looked like in the George Bush years and what one looked like at around the time that you said, holy hell, I can't do this anymore. So they're used to it. Most of the large gun companies have corporate councils who review marketing plans. And um, for most of the years I was in the industry, when a new firearms product would be developed, somebody would want to name it something. And when that name would be developed, it would be run through the council's office and they would say, look, don't do this, do that. Don't, don't do anything that's irresponsible. Don't do anything that encourages people. Don't name it something or market it in some way that can be that can be deemed irresponsible. We might get sued for that or bad outcomes might happen. So for a century or more, you had guns like the Smith & Wesson 629 and the Remington Model 870, right? For non-gun people, like these are just average guns with numbers and letters on them. They don't sound terrible. You know, there's nothing frightening about an 870 or a 629. Today, we have a firearm called the Ultimate Arms Warmonger. We have an AR-15 called the Wilson Arms Urban Super Sniper. We have the Black Rain Ordnance 3 Percenter Mall. We have, I mean, I could go on and on and on. So you see the, the decency, the responsibility has been pulled from the marketing. And I assume people spend money on marketing campaigns because marketing works. We have a company, one of the largest retailers in the country who produced a gun marketed directly to the Boogaloo boys. They called it, just to be cute, they called it the Big Igloo instead of the Boogaloo. So they could have some, I, I know the subtleness is crazy there, but they wanted some divorce from actually calling a Boogaloo, but it was a Hawaiian print AK-47. And so the the plug has been pulled on decency and responsibility and marketing. And I assume the marketing works. I mean, uh, another example, you know, voting from the rooftops is a common refrain inside of sort of far right gun circles. And that means when things don't get your way, you grab your rifle and get up on the rooftop and vote with bullets. Um, frightening. We now have a firearms company, um, an AR-15 company called Rooftop Arms. That's the literal name of the company. I think that should frighten people. I think it's deeply irresponsible. It's something that the industry never itself would have allowed 10 or 15 years ago, not through law, not through regulation, just through common decency and norms of behavior. And I feel like that's a l so similar and parallel to our politics. The things that we now, um, I mean, look, let's face it, Lauren Boebert would not have been allowed in the Republican Party 10 or 15 years ago. You wouldn't be tweeting out pictures or videos of one, uh, one member of Congress joking about killing another member of Congress, right? Paul Gosar and AOC. So the norms of behavior have been ripped apart just like they have in the firearms industry. Ryan, one of the things that's striking to me is it's not just politics, it's the court too. And one of the things we talk about so much on this show is the ways in which this kind of Roberts Court conservative supermajority is fomenting that same sense of vigilantism, of self-help, of mistrust of the government bureaucrat who's coming to take your stuff. It threads through so much of the opinion writing in cases about schools, right, in cases about the COVID vaccine. This kind of paranoid view that because nobody is to be trusted, uh, you should arm yourself to the teeth because when civil war comes, that's a rational act. And it's threaded through some of the Bruin opinion. I mean, you really get the sense that, you know, the best solution for all of us is for you to be fully armed on the subway. So it's not just the culture that's changed. It's the court itself, you know, in, whether, you know, even in Heller, there were so many faints at saying we are a civilized society. Nobody's bringing a gun into this place, this place, this place. And it feels like even that has moved in the court's own, not only in the discourse, but kind of in the, the, the zeitgeist of how the court itself views the world. I think it's very interesting that Antonin Scalia is essentially, he's a saint, nearly a god to um, to the right, to the political right, and certainly um, to the firearms community. And yet, some of the phraseology in Heller is now all but under complete disdain 
from the political right. There, there is, yes, I think Anthony Kennedy, as we know, probably um, cajoled Scalia into, into adding some of the phrases about regulation in Heller, but they're very, very clear. They essentially say, look, yes, there is this right. Do not mistake me. There still has to be decent regulation or society is going to come apart. That's basically what Heller says. Well, we have fast forwarded to today, today where they say, ah, don't worry about that society coming apart thing. Really? Is that, is that the country we want to live in? Um, we should be worried about that. And I honestly, I kind of think that 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 the Roberts court, or at least Roberts, is starting to wrestle with that a little bit. Sort of like, hmm, th- did we take this too far? I don't know. You know, because there's another, what did we go, 75, 80 years between Second Amendment cases, and now we're going to go two? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, they're, they're yeah. going to wrestle with one here again. Yeah. No, I think we're we're and we're in a moment. I mean, we, we think about this so much right now at Slate, but we're in a moment where the minute you get your win, you push it uh, because you know you've got six, and so there there's no win that <laughs> while while the win is still like you know smoking hot, you go for the next thing, and that's what. Rahimi is. Um, Just before we get to Rahimi, I want to ask you, you know, we all live out (laughs) our lives now in this test that was laid out, as you mentioned, in Bruin. You know, here's Clarence Thomas saying, if there's no historical analogous gun law that existed in 1791 or 1868, then it's unconstitutional. That's the test now. And I, I think you warned in a pretty clarion call after Bruin came down that this was going to be like waking up in a town with no stop signs. Talk a little bit just from, again, an insider of both how the gun industry works and thinks and how they litigate, why this originalist test is so just utterly flawed in your view. Well, uh, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll say I did. I wrote that. I wrote an Atlantic piece. I called editors of the Atlantic after the Bruin piece came out and I said, I, I, I mean, I know you guys are all focused on Dobbs. I'm warning you that what that case, the Bruin case, is going to have unbelievable impacts on what everybody thinks about as reasonable, decent firearms regulation. Look, it's going to strike down a few things that are probably too restrictive and egregious. I'm fine with that. But the way, I mean, it, again, it basically says, as you said, if, if the law doesn't exist in 1794, it can't exist now. Well, here's here's an example uh, as as we're getting ready to discuss. A domestic abuser, as he's un- awaiting trial, his firearm is taken. That's been that's law in, in lots of states. This particular case will test whether it's constitutional to remove his firearm before he's convicted, even if um, there's all sorts of other egregious um, many, uh, circumstances. The reason that's coming down is because guess what? Domestic abuse wasn't even against the law in 1794. It wasn't even a thing in 1794. So essentially, Clarence Thomas said, well... You know, it was legal to uh, beat your spouse in 1794. We can't be taking people's guns. Really? I mean, really? Is that what we want? Um, Other things. You know, there's already a case being brought against firearm serialization. And all guns in this country produced by licensed manufacturers have to be serialized so they can be traced in crime and all that sort of things. Well, guess what? 1794, there wasn't a law about, about serialization. That's gone. I could go on and on and on. These aren't these aren't like crazy, far-flung, left, Soviet-type regulations. These are just normal, I mean, domestic abuse. And this and this particular case we're going to talk about, be, be difficult to dream up a more egregious case of domestic abuse and, and dangerousness than this guy. So, yeah. More in a moment from Ryan Bussey on how the big gun industry used cultural and political radicalization to drive gun sales and what that means for the Supreme Court and for democracy. This episode is brought to you by Choiceology, an original podcast from Charles Schwab. Choiceology is a show all about the psychology and economics behind our decisions. Each episode shares the latest research in behavioral science and dives into questions like, can we learn to make smarter decisions? Or what is the power of negative thinking? The show is hosted by Katie Milkman. She's an award-winning behavioral scientist, professor at the Wharton School, and author of the best-selling book, How to Change. In each episode, Katie talks to authors, athletes, Nobel laureates, and more about why we make irrational choices and how we can make better ones. Choiceology is out now 
listen and subscribe at schwab.com slash podcast or find it wherever you listen. When the Supreme Court decided to end the constitutional right to an abortion, they stole people's freedoms and stripped them of their ability to control their own bodies. But this movement won't be defeated. All across the country, every time abortion rights are put directly to the people through ballot initiatives in states like Kansas, California, Michigan, Vermont, and Montana, supporters have fought back and won, protected, or expanded access to abortion. That's because the right to an abortion is the majority opinion. Did you know that 85% of Americans believe abortion should be legal? 85%. Planned Parenthood knows that healthcare equity, including access to safe, legal abortion, is a human right. They'll fight with everything they've got to protect that right. But they need your help. To join the movement, donate to Planned Parenthood today and visit PlannedParenthood.org slash future. Okay, so let's talk about it. We, we, you know, in November, the high court is going to hear a case invalidating the conviction of a guy who was in possession of gun. He was subject to a domestic violence protective order. It was issued after he violently assaulted his domestic park partner. He dragged her through a parking lot. He shot at her car. Uh, the Fifth Circuit cheerfully described him as, quote, hardly a model citizen as they reversed his conviction because of Bruin after Bruin came down. So, you know, hashtag history, as you say, there's just no, you know, restraining order because women were hashtag chattel. Um, so talk a little bit about what is the landscape? I have seen that even some of the most enthusiastic uh, NRA folks, and, and as you say, their groups much more radical than the NRA, are a little hinky about Zaki Rahimi being the poster boy here. Before we get into the legal argument, I want to hear from a single citizen who thinks it's a good idea that that dude has a bunch of guns while he's threatening to kill his domestic partner. I mean, can we legally or not, can we agree it's not a good idea for him to be that dangerous? Um, I certainly want, wouldn't want my daughter or mom or sister or anybody to be around that guy with loaded guns. So I think socially, finally, we've reached a point where everybody can agree on that. Now, legally, Clarence Thomas has taken the lid off of that social agreement, I think. He's basically said, I don't, I don't care if you all agree. Domestic abuse wasn't a law in 1794. Um, and I do think reasonable people inside the firearms industry and certainly millions of gun owners are like, and now, mm, no, that's, that's not what we're thinking here. Did, um, Clarence Thomas really mean that when they wrote that? And I, I, I just wonder if other justices on the court are going, Clarence, hey, uh, you sold us a bill of goods on this thing. I, I'm very curious about this. I was very struck in the briefing in Rahimi about this funny tension between and, 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 you know, we were just thinking about it last term when there was a case about a guy who was stalking and harassing a musician and the court ended up massively protecting his, you know, free speech rights because we don't want to chill people who just want to send somebody a thousand Facebook messages about knowing where they are. And it feels like exactly the same zeitgeist here where you have, you know, we don't want to chill gun owners. There's another interest here, which is in a country where domestic uh, partner abuse is endemic, there are people who are going to die at the hands of their partner. And it's invisible in the conversation in much the way that it was invisible in Bruin. And I, I'm so struck by who we center in these conversations about rights. And I think my follow on to that, and I just really wanted to ask you about it because I've heard you talk about this before in other fora. But, you know, I lived through Charlottesville in 2017 when the white supremacists and the Proud Boys and the Nazis marched. And I have said publicly before, it was analyzed as though it was a pure speech case. It was analyzed by the courts as though this was like the Skokie case. And all we're thinking about is the First Amendment right to march. It's not a First Amendment case when there are guns there. 
you've talked a lot about how there are interests that just fundamentally change when the Second Amendment is involved. And you can analyze it as a speech case, but it's a gun case now. And I would love for you to expound a little bit on how we got to this situation where, you know, I, I, I've heard you say it in terms of, you know, a dinner party is only a kind of First Amendment activity until somebody's standing over your shoulder with a gun, and then it's not a First Amendment activity. Can you talk about how both the court in Bruin and also the gun industry has just obliterated the interests on the other side, including the like right to be alive and to function freely and not live in terror? I think you're exactly right. I think about our country, the general legal structure, our rule of law, our founding documents. I start with this idea that the overarching rights of all citizens are uh, centered on the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Everything we do, I think, if it's going to work, has to be balanced against the potential of taking anybody's life liberty, or pursuit of happiness away from them. And I think the right, and, I, and, and a few justices, one of them named Sam and one of them named Clarence, um, I think they understand that dinner party thing, which is you can usurp all of our legal structure and our society, um, our sort of norms of decency and responsibility with one simple act. And I and, and again, that dinner party thing, I think it is powerful. But if you're sitting around a dinner party, chatting with your friends, having some wine, maybe even having loud political discussions, everything goes just good, right? Because that's the rules of your dinner party. And then your 10th friend shows up with an AR loaded AR strapped to his chest and sets down at the dinner party. Boom. All conversation stops, right? There is no more civility. There are no more nine opinions in the room. There's just one opinion in the room. And I think the far right understands that is a very quick and efficient way to usurp our rule of law and our decency and our elections. That's why they show up to try to intimidate people at elections with AR-15s. My book opens with my own son being intimidated by one of these guys. And I'm in the gun industry when it's happening. That the I just don't quite understand how a functioning democracy is going to continue to churn with that sort of um, upending intimidation. So I, I think I think we have to center everything on people's right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness and balance things against that. That's why we started a country, to be alive, to be happy, to have <laughs> – to, to pursue things we want to do. So – one of the things that we talk about a ton on this show is the ways in which, you know, a handful of originalist justices were just kind of purchased by billionaires and millionaires who had business interests before the court. Um, and by the way, they're paying modern U.S. dollars. They're not using the continental currency that was used uh, in the colonies. You talk about the ways in which the gun industry and the NRA was part of that same capture and, you know, this was not just Harlan Crow. This was the NRA, too. And I I want to just give you a chance to, for because it is a show about the Supreme Court, to end on this note of how do we get out of a situation <laughs> where we have justices who are just beholden one way or another to money and interests of one side, rendering the interests of the other side and by the way, you know, things that poll in 80 percent, right, like, you know, red flag laws. How do we unwind this, Ryan? Because I, I share your sense that we are at an existential tipping point and that, you know, the court flaming vigilantism while arming the citizenry, while fomenting distrust in government is a really explosive combination. But this is the court we have. What do we do? Well, this bubbles up through you know, base level politics. That's why it is what it is, right? The NRA figured out how to create a single issue constituency that was very, very dedicated and would basically construct a litmus test, would make extremism a litmus test. Um, they were good at that. I believe we're at a precipice, but I also am quite hopeful. There are a lot of people in the country who are quietly very distressed, worried over it, done with it. Um, and, and a lot of them are gun owners. I know when I wrote my book, um, you know, 
I, I could have got all kinds of feedback. Sarah and I and my wife, we were worried about our kids going to school. We were worried about our digital safety. We were worried about people on top of the hill. We, you know, all those things. I was worried about getting up every morning and having 10,000 emails with lots of misspelled words and calling me weird sexual innuendo names. Like, I, I, I've got a couple of those. But um, almost all of them, 95%, 98% are positive, are concerned are grammatically correct. They come from West Virginia and they come from West Texas and they come from North Carolina and they, they're they gun owners, families of gun owners who basically say, this has gone too far. I love my guns. I want to keep them, but our country's at risk. I get, I just get these over and over. And so I think there is this vast frustrated majority that is hidden by this thin veneer of loud radicalization. And we got to figure out a way to crack that. I, I don't have the answer, but the, the last thing I'll say is the industry once knew that this was very dangerous. Um, not very long ago, less than 20 years ago, the industry would not allow tactical gear of any sort in its own trade shows. Wouldn't allow that sort of advertising. It wasn't a law. It was just a norm of behavior. And the industry wouldn't allow it because it knew that propagating this stuff through a complex democracy with all sorts of problems that democracies have would probably lead to bad outcomes. So I'm not asking or advocating for us to go forward to some crazy, um, unimagined time. I'm just, like, we did it not that long ago, you know, so we could just go back to that. Ryan Bussey's 2021 book is Gunfight, My Battle Against the Industry That Radicalized America. He is a senior advisor for Giffords, a gun violence prevention group led by Gabby Gifford. And he is seeking to be the next governor of Montana. Ryan, I can't thank you enough for helping, I think, me and hopefully listeners reframe this as not a sort of binary question about the Second Amendment, but a really focused set of questions about an industry that has outsized influence on a Supreme Court. Yeah, so I appreciate that. I, um, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention we can roll back some of this radicalization. We can be responsible, decent citizens and be gun owners at the same time. Um, my website is Bussy. It's B U S S E for Montana dot com, and would love any help anybody can give. I'm running against a self funding billionaire who flies around in uh, two thousand dollar an hour private jets, none of which I have. Um, perhaps he'll be flying around a Supreme Court justice. I don't know, but I'm not doing that. And I would love help from anybody. So thanks for having me on, Talia. Thank you. By the way, on this show, we don't call them private jets oh. in the manner of Justice Alito. We call them facilities because then you don't have to disclose them. So just just pointing out, I have no private facilities either. <laughs> Ryan, thank you for being with us. Okay, thank you. We're going to pause for a word from some of our sponsors. And when we come back, the impossible task of being an abortion provider in post-Row America. We'll hear from healthcare professionals trying to navigate a baffling and chilling new legal landscape, a landscape that may be set to change again very radically if the Supreme Court dockets the medication abortion case. And now we're going to pause to hear from our friends at NetSuite. So your business was humming, but now you're falling behind. Your teams are buried in manual work, and it's taking forever to close the books. If this is you, you should know these three numbers, 36,000, 25, 1. 36,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining, accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25 NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins, everything you need, all in one place. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance, absolutely free, at netsuite.com slash amicus. That's netsuite.com slash A-M-I-C-U-S to get your own KPI checklist, netsuite.com slash 
Amicus. Did you know the new National Army Museum in Alexandria, Virginia, was made possible by the generosity of grateful Americans? The nonprofit Army Historical Foundation led the campaign to build the museum, and they continue to ask for your support. Your generosity will go directly to the mission they have carried out for 40 years, ensuring America never forgets the service of our soldiers. Show your appreciation to all who have served by making a contribution to the Army Historical Foundation. Give today at armyhistory.org. That's armyhistory.org. Two years ago this month, a vigilante-enforced abortion ban was passed in Texas. The Supreme Court promptly greenlit that on the shadow docket. And as we reeled from the implications of SB 8, everyone can sue anyone involved in helping pregnant people access abortion mechanism, healthcare providers scrambled to make sense of an emerging landscape of legal landmines that became even more extreme less than a year later when Dobbs set off trigger laws and new abortion bans in almost half the states. As these decades-old trigger laws snapped into effect all over the country, OBGYNs, anesthesiologists, nurses, and hospital boards were suddenly faced with figuring out untested and intimidating legislation in real time. Real time, in this case, being the very swift tick-tock of medical care necessary for pregnant people, many of whom do not experience hallmark channel pregnancies and deliveries. Real time meaning what would become life and death decisions that have no correlation to the standard of care worldwide. This startling and confusing new reality for healthcare providers is documented in an incredible new podcast series that features intimate conversations with abortion providers across the country, including providers in red states who have had to remain silent. I'm joined this week by Allison Block, executive producer and host of Post Row America from The Nocturnists, an award-winning medical storytelling program that has centered the voices of more than 450 clinicians since 2016 through its podcast and sold-out live performances. Allie is a family doctor, abortion provider, and assistant professor of family medicine at Brown University. So, Allie, it is such a pleasure to welcome you to Amicus. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. So when we were first in touch over email about this season of the show, you pointed out that while we have heard lots, too many harrowing accounts of what these new abortion restrictions mean for pregnant people, we just really haven't heard much from the providers who are now precluded from giving the kind of care they were trained to offer or forced to make these impossible <laughs> risk calculations that were never taught in law school. So can you just start by talking about what you set out to do with the new series and then how you did it? Sure. So I'm an abortion provider, as you mentioned. So this is really my community. And I'm on all these group chats and text threads and listservs where people are talking about these experiences that they're having. And I wasn't seeing any of it reflected in the mainstream media, which, again, like you're saying, there's so much really great, really important journalism happening that's following the pregnant people and the atrocious outcomes for them, which, yes, of course, should be centered. And I think the flip side to the story is really important. So I've been involved with the Nocturnist since 2016, and this is what we do. We do healthcare worker storytelling. And so we were really set up to do this series because we already have a lot of contacts in the medical community and people that trust us with their stories. And so we sort of knew right away when Dobbs came down that we wanted to do a series on post row America and really lean into those networks that we have of physicians across the country and specifically all these abortion providers. Because when you hear about the stories of the pregnant patients, so, you know, on, in, on the red state side or the restricted state side, you're hearing these terrible stories of the patients that are hemorrhaging and basically being told, like, go wait in the parking lot until you're hemorrhaging more because your fetus still has heart tones. Or patients that find out that they have these horrible uh, fetal anomalies and are told, sorry, you have to carry the pregnancy to term. But what we don't hear is sort of the flip side of that, which are the providers that are really being forced to enact that care against their will and sort of the moral harm 
against that's being inflicted upon those providers. You know, some, I'm sure, in these red states are very happy to turn these patients away. But many work in these communities, love these communities, love their work, want to be taking good care of patients, and feel like their hands are really tied. So that's on the red state side. And then on the blue state side, the really interesting stories are the ones in these sort of border states, places like Kansas, and, you know, not what we typically think of as border states, but bordering these huge swaths of the country where now abortion is illegal or restricted, that are absorbing this like total tsunami of impact. So states like Kansas, and states like Illinois, and what that's been like for the providers that are really having to sort of deal with the fallout. In a sense, Ali, it feels like, I think the reflexive response after Dobbs was, well, all those providers should just leave red states. Like, they should just go. And I love what you're saying, which is, no, people there need care. And then, in some sense, the burden shifts onto the providers to figure out, like, I'm I'm here for you. I love this community. I want to do my job. It makes no sense to close up shop in some sense, but I'm hamstrung. And I think hearing from those folks what that hardship is, is just really essential because this is not a binary. So move, just move to California. It doesn't work that way. Totally. We talked to one provider from Texas who chose to remain anonymous, and she talked about really the anger that she felt post-Dobbs towards all the Californians and all the New Yorkers who sort of said things like that, like either oh, well, you know, screw Texas because they made these laws so they sort of deserve what's coming to them or sure, the providers should just move or, oh, well, the providers should just break the law and just provide the care anyway. And all of those are totally unreasonable things to ask of an actual individual human being. Like you're saying, these are people that really love their communities. And we have talked to plenty who, despite really loving their communities, feel like their work and their lives are now totally untenable and have moved. And that's heartbreaking in its own way because they're leaving behind this total void of care, not just abortion care, but the other services that they were providing in their community. Or you have the ones who are staying and they're faced with, you know, every day, again, being in a position of having to deny patients care that they would love to be providing. So it is. I mean, it's just kind of heartbreaking. So You've just said, but let's say it again, that we really haven't heard from a lot of red state providers for a good reason. Many of them are just trying to keep their heads down and do their jobs and not rain litigation down upon themselves and become targets of threats and violence. But the series is so important because it brings these voices in. And I think I want to start, as you do in the series, with Nikki Zeit in Tennessee, because Tennessee's trigger law was one of the most restrictive, no exceptions, and pretty much the minute Dobbs comes down performing any kind of abortion, including one necessary to save the life of the mother, just becomes a felony overnight. And so Nikki knew this was coming. She was not, I think, taken by surprise by the end of Roe. Um, But she did express some grim gallows humor about what her life was like post-Roe, and it becomes really clear that some of her colleagues just need a little more time to catch up and process. So let's listen to Nikki. I called the day before and said, I'm scheduling a felony for 11 o'clock tomorrow. No, um, <laughs> I said, uh, you know, we have a patient, there's still fetal heartbeats, but her water broke at 12 weeks. She's 14 weeks now. She's starting to show signs of infection. And tomorrow at 11, we're going to proceed with the d and we always gave the heads up so that we made sure we had people in the operating room that were comfortable with pregnancy termination. And so when I got there, I said, you know, thank you for covering this case to the anesthesiologist. And he's like, oh, I always do these. I'm fine with that. And I'm like, well, yeah, but thanks for aiding and abetting. And he's like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, we're about to commit a felony. And he's like, no, we're not. You told me that this is medically necessary. And I'm like, right. Right. But our law says that it's a felony, even if it's medically necessary. And then if I'm charged, I can defend myself in explaining why I felt like it was medically necessary and just blank stare. And then he like turns around and calls the head of his department. Like, she says it's a felony. I mean, like I can hear him on the phone, right? She says it's a felony. I mean, what is this? And they're like, yeah, it's a felony. 
So it's a felony, and yet they want to do their jobs. So how are they figuring out, the folks you spoke to, how to square the law with their duty of care? I mean, it's basically impossible. And everybody's doing the best they can. You know, Nikki talks in the series and in the interview about this really amazing sort of consensus building that she's doing among all the key stakeholders in the hospital. So that's sort of the best she can do. She gets everybody together, right? The anesthesiologists, the nurses, the hospital administration, the um, the medical malpractice people. She sort of brings them all together and says, okay, you know, this law is nonsense, right? There's no way to comply with this law because the law says this is illegal no matter what, except in the instance of threat to the life of the mother, but that's an affirmative defense. So you could probably explain this a lot better than I could, but my understanding is basically affirmative defense is sort of guilty until proven innocent. So even in the event where you're saving the life of the pregnant person, it's still a felony, but if you were charged, you could go to court and make that defense, and then you would be found innocent. Um, So that's not a great feeling (laughs) to be doing those cases. But at the same time, I think in all of these cases, the providers are so dedicated and their Hippocratic oath and their sense of moral duty and responsibility is stronger. And so again, it's, it's basically just an impossible daily calculation that from what we heard is just completely exhausting every day to kind of have you know, have to be making those decisions and those choices. So so the way I thought about it when I was listening, Allie, was that, like, instead of just being in the, like, TV show, like, House or Do Ye Hauser, where you're just doctoring, now you've got this other movie that's playing at the same time, and it's called, like, Law and Order, right? And and you've got to toggle back and forth and figure out how to do health care as you're figuring out how to lawyer this new inexplicable, as you say, confusing legislation. Let's hear from Nikki again. I mean, our trigger law was two pages. Like it didn't say very much. It basically said you can't do anything. So pretty quickly, they came to the realization that what the law did or didn't say was a lot worse than what they had assumed. So essentially, not only are you sort of first responders on the medical side, you're first responders on, like, parsing confusing legislation. Yeah, and I think it's just, you know, people talk about, oh, well, now, you know, I'm a doctor and now I have to be a lawyer at the same time. But that's not really even it because you just really can't sort of assimilate or integrate these two systems together, right? So the medical framework and the medical system is just sort of inherently incompatible with the legal system. You can't map them onto each other. Here's Nikki describing trying to figure out what the law does and doesn't allow for. If someone has a cardiac defect and the cardiologist says that they have a 15% chance of dying, you know, we don't know. What if the DA or somebody disagrees and someone gets criminalized? Yeah, I mean, this is something that we heard from people a lot, this phrase of like, is someone dying enough, right? Are they dying enough to justify me taking action? And that's what I mean when I say that the legal and medical frameworks of thinking about this are inherently incompatible. Like, you don't talk in medicine, you never learn in medical school or residency how to assess how much someone is dying and whether or not it warrants intervention. If someone is dying at all, (laughs) you do something about it. So this kind of idea of parsing in the moment, again, it's just, it's really impossible and it's totally incompatible with our training. And it's also not quantifiable. I mean, I think that's the other thing is so much of medicine actually exists in the gray. I think that in general in medicine, a huge issue that we have with sort of the general population is people think that everything is black and white in medicine. And if doctors just like did the right thing, that they would get better. And when they have a bad outcome, it's because doctors did the wrong thing. And actually human bodies are really complex and there's no way to say 100% in this example, you know, whether or not this patient will die from this hemorrhage or not. You can't play out that sort of alternate scenario. So I think that, It's just, again, it just kind of comes back to it's impossible to hold both of those frameworks at the same time. And people are doing amazing work. And, you know, we hear from Nikki in the episode, she's doing the best that she can. Um, But it's really, really hard. 
Ali, one of the things that was so striking is not just, as you say, trying to square these two frameworks that are incompatible, but also just how much time it takes away from doing medicine, often in cases where there's an exigent, life-threatening risk where you don't have the time. So I want to listen to Nikki again, just talking about not just the split brain, but also there's a cost to the split brain. Care was still delayed because we were calling lawyers or getting people to look at images three and four times, you know, when it was a ectopic that like previously we would have been like, oh, that's an ectopic. Let's go to the OR. Let's offer her methotrexate. Now it was like, hey, you look at this and make sure you agree and put your name on it too. And you look at this and you agree so that we can get a couple people in agreement and therefore our defense would be stronger. I mean, my documentation is pristine. You know, I would quote the law and then quote how I was complying with the law per recommendation from counsel. And it certainly does not enhance my patient's medical care. It just takes up time and takes up space in my brain that I don't have anymore. Like, I should be making sure I remember all the medications to use when somebody bleeds during a surgery, not how to quote a law. And I wonder if for the not doctors among us, which is me, uh, can you talk a little (laughs) bit about how, as a provider, you think through these decisions? And for states, red states with abortion bans, how the practice of medicine has just fundamentally changed as a result of not being able to act quickly. Yeah, well, I have had sort of a front row seat to how different it is to practice in the two places, because mostly I live and work and have lived and worked in unrestricted states and blue states. I lived in California for a long time. Now I live in the Northeast. So that's where my practice has always been. And then about a year ago, I started working at this clinic in Kansas, Trust Women, that we also feature in the series. And so, you know, I had been chugging along providing abortions for over a decade in California. So I sort of waltzed into this clinic in Kansas and just realized and was so humbled about how naive I had been about exactly what you're talking about, sort of the mental load that the practitioners in the red states are carrying around at all times. So it happens in a couple different directions. One is sort of this extreme meticulousness that they need around all the documentation. I mean, you know, doctors, obviously, we have to document. We're very careful with those things. But just this feeling like you're under a legal microscope at all times um, and that people are really out to get you takes up a lot of mental energy, like you're saying. And then when it comes to the medical decision making, again, there are just sort of whole layers that I never had to deal with in blue states. So an example would be patients at the clinic where I worked in California There were so many resources where to send patients that were a little bit more high risk medically. So if you had a patient who had, you know, a sort of low blood count with significant anemia or even any patient that had ever had a C-section and was over 14 weeks, at the clinic where I was, they just didn't do those cases because they could send them to UCSF. They could send them to any number of places that were equipped to deal with the higher risk cases. And I went to this clinic in Kansas and I saw my first patient that was, you know, 15 weeks and it had a couple C-sections. And I was sort of like, oh, so where do we send her? (laughs) And they were like, what do you mean? Where do we send her? This is where we do it. If she doesn't get it done here, she doesn't get it done. And so then, again, you're really having to weigh the medical risks of this specific procedure and how safe it is, what will it mean for the clinic and for the people who work at the clinic if this winds up being a complication or a bad outcome and a hospital transfer and all of the local news is going to come out and all of the antis are going to come out? And what does that mean for the clinic and its future? So there's just, again, so many. And, you know, the pregnant person, if I turn this person away because I'm a little bit nervous about this procedure, that alters the course of their whole life. They don't get this procedure at all. And how do I weigh that? And again, it's all gray. There's no right answers, but it's an enormous mental load. I want to wind the clock back even before Dobbs, um, because even before Dobbs, Texas had been leading the way in novel and extreme and I would say punitive restrictions since September of 2021, because that's when SB8, uh, the quote-unquote vigilante law, 
goes into effect. And I wonder if, you know, you, you the, the, the second episode, uh, you go back to SB8 and we meet Dr. Bhavik Kumar, who's from Texas. And I wonder if you, you, before we hear his voice, can just tell us a little bit more about him, how and why he came to work in abortion care. I would love to. Bavik is an amazing family doctor. I've interacted with him in a number of different ways over the years. He's originally from Texas, so he strongly identifies as a Texan, but he also strongly identifies with a number of disenfranchised minority groups. So he's gay, he's a person of color, and growing up in Texas with those aspects of his identity, he was really aware of the inequities that existed especially around abortion care and around reproductive health. Growing up, you would see that the white folks would have sex and drink and go to parties, but they were going to church and signing up on their abstinence pledges. So they had access to whatever they needed. They lived the lives that they needed. And then you'd see the black and brown folks that, you know, had very different access to things. I think for me as a gay brown kid, I was in the shadows. I was trying to be quiet. And so I was observing so much of that. And then I think about the stories that I would hear about kids in high school drinking bleach. You know, that was always black and brown folks. It was never the white girls, right? They always went off to Dallas and came back not pregnant. He went and got his medical training. He knew he wanted to be an abortion provider. So he went to New York to get that training because he wasn't able to get that training in Texas. And then he talks about how he was tempted to stay because it's a lot easier to be an abortion provider in New York than in Texas for all the reasons that you've described. But he really felt called back to his community. And again, this is a theme that we hear come up a lot in the series is people being called back to their communities. And so he went back to Texas and was chugging along, providing care and teaching there. And that was sort of where he was when SB8 came down. It's it's astonishing and heartbreaking, this moment of the clock quite literally ticking down to September 1, 2021, when SB8 goes into effect. So August 31st of that year, I was in the clinic providing abortion care. We stayed there. I think I left at about 10 p.m., which is not our usual. But the goal was to see any and every patient that we were able to. So Texas has a law where the same doctor who does the ultrasound has to do the procedure. So that meant that was just me. I did have help with two of my colleagues, but they could help with some of the other things. I was thankful for them being there. And so we saw every patient that we possibly could. I think we saw almost 60 people that day for abortion care. And then the next day when the law went into effect, about half of the patients I saw qualified for an abortion under that law. And then half of the patients we had to refer out of state. Over the first month or two, it was extremely devastating. I can still have flashbacks of people crying and asking for help, telling me what's happening in their life, why they can't be pregnant. It It is just so heavy because, you know, we go through so much training and security risks and safety assessments because we know exactly why this care is so important. And then you have somebody begging and pleading with you. and And I'm not the person that needs to hear any of that. I want to provide this care for you. But in that moment, that person is there with a healthcare provider who should help them. They don't need to reckon with the state and this law and who passed it and who introduced it. And why did they? that's not important to them. You're a doctor. Help me. You in your second episode, uh, which drops this Thursday, what you fundamentally do is just trace these aftershocks of SB8, how they manifest in Bavik's professional life, and then also for providers in neighboring states. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So for Bavik and other providers like him in Texas and the other states that abortion became illegal or heavily restricted, it's the situation that we were talking about before that you know, Bavik lives in his community. He loves his community. He wants to work there. And he loves abortion work. And this is the kind of work that he wants to provide. So ultimately, he and other providers like him are sort of faced with this choice, continue to live in the place that I love or continue to do the work that I love. And on top of that feeling like, living in the place that you love, your hands are really tied. Because it's not as though the work just goes away. The work is still there, and you're not allowed to do it. So you're seeing these patients 
every day who really need your care and you're not allowed to help them. So on a you know personal level for Bavik, he talks about he makes the decision to stay and be as much as possible a voice of compassion and reason and support and advocacy in his community. He and a lot of other providers um, like him have pivoted to doing a lot of gender affirming work for as long as that's allowed in Texas and um, other reproductive health work that is sort of within the scope of what the law allows. So that's the choice that he made. And other providers, again, are making different choices. And in terms of um, the episode about SB8 and Texas, what we do is we follow, you know, when the abortion access gets cut off in Texas, Texas was chugging along at about 55,000 abortions a year. So that's 55,000 patients that had to go elsewhere. Now, of course, many of them don't go elsewhere because it takes a lot of resources to get, I mean, Texas is a huge state. So depending on where you are in Texas to get out of Texas to another state where abortion is legal is already almost impossible, but many do. Um, And then, so again, we follow in the particular episode, we follow how that kind of crashes into Oklahoma and then subsequently into Kansas. But of course, you know, the same stories could be told of New Mexico um, or other, you know, sort of closer, closer in states. Um, And so then in our third episode, we take the listeners to the clinic I work in Kansas, Trust Women, which is one of these clinics that's really absorbing a huge influx of patients from Texas. And they're doing pretty amazing things. I mean, they're having to basically completely rework their entire workflow, you know, triple, quadruple their staff just to accommodate it. And I think what you really hear from people again and again is there is no accommodating it, right? There's no one tiny independent clinic in Kansas that can suddenly absorb all of the abortions from all of Texas. So you're just kind of doing your best and you're trying to do your best in a way that is as sustainable as possible because you can imagine it's a real recipe for burnout to see these patients day in, day out. And you could fill the schedule, right? You could be running the clinic 24-7, 365, and still not meeting the need. So a lot of these clinics are trying to think about, okay, well, how do we meet a need as much as possible and still be sustainable and still have a workforce that can show up every day and doesn't just leave because the work otherwise would be sort of too backbreaking and too heartbreaking? So, so, Allie, this is ultimately a show about the Supreme Court and what it has wrought and the impact on the ground, not just for patients, as we're describing, but also for providers. And we sit in the shadow of the Supreme Court taking up a case about medication abortion and the real possibility that this mifepristone case uh, is going to hit the docket before very long. And I feel like it's just going to be one more version of what you are describing again and again and again, which is now we have to try to map the standard of care, what we've been taught to do and trained to do, what we want to give our patients with this legal (laughs) landscape that changes by the minute, changes state by state, is almost impossible to interpret and understand. And by the way, you could lose your license. And so I just wonder if you can talk about both through the lens of what you're thinking about in terms of the show and in terms of your own work, um, how yourself, how are other providers preparing for what could be just another seismic change after the court hears the Mifepristone case? I mean, part of it is that it's just kind of impossible to keep up. One thing that we talk about in the series is how one of the reasons I think that the right has been so much more effective on this than the left is that this is all the right has to do. All they have to do is come up with sort of nefarious ways to restrict access to reproductive care, whereas the people on the left have to actually be providing the reproductive care. So that's really time consuming. And some of the providers and clinics that I know are, you know, especially when the Mifepristone case seemed like it was going to be determined last summer, kind of before it was kicked down the road. All the clinics I knew were sort of scrambling to come up with new workflows and new protocols. And it is a really extreme example of just sort of the egregiousness of how much we're not allowed to provide the standard of care, right? So the Mifepristone case, we have these really clear protocols. We have a mesoprostol only protocol for abortion, without the use of mifepristone. Ali, will you, for the non-doctors, just walk through quickly the two meds and what what they do, just because I think um, not everybody knows 
what happens in a yes. miffy free world. Yes, of course. So the standard way that medication abortions are delivered now in the United States, which is sort of considered best practice, is at the time of the initiation of the abortion, the patient gets one pill called mifepristone, and that the way we describe it is that it sort of stops the pregnancy from growing. And then a certain amount of time later, depending on how it's taken, between 12 and 72 hours later, the patient takes mesoprostol, which is the second pill, which does not seem to be on any sort of legal attack because that pill is used so much in obstetric care that it would be sort of insane to make that um, pill illegal. So Then the patient takes this second set of pills, mesoprostol, and that really allows them to pass the pregnancy. Now, this method is sort of the most effective, the most safe, the most well-tolerated. There are regimens and protocols for a mesoprostol-only approach to a medication abortion, where you basically take mesoprostol, and then you take more mesoprostol, and then you take more mesoprostol until you pass the pregnancy. It's unpleasant. It's less effective. And some would argue that it's less safe because you have a higher risk of retained products and things like hemorrhage. So it's clearly not the standard of care. Again, it is still state. It is still safe. And we will do it if we have to. But it's certainly not the preferred method. So if mifepristone is made illegal, which, by the way, mifepristone is also really important in miscarriage management and is the standard of care in miscarriage management. So it would make all of that care much worse. So everybody basically is just sort of scrambling one day at a time, hoping for the best, preparing for the worst is sort of the best way that I can say it. Allie, before I say goodbye, I think I want to just note what I think you're doing with this project and let you just reflect on it for a second. It seems to me we started saying after SB8 and again after Dobbs and then after this raft of laws that, you know, punish, quote, unquote, abortion trafficking, you know, make it unlawful to cross state lines, make it unlawful to send a text inquiring about procuring medication abortion. All of these laws seem to have both the purpose and effect of utterly isolating somebody in the moment that they are most vulnerable and terrified, Mm. not only from care, but from talking to anyone around them who might help them access care. Mm -hmm. A part of what I think your project is, is sort of broadening the lens and saying, you know, who else is being terrorized and uh, uh, isolated and afraid to speak and, um, you know, not sure of where their support comes from is all these providers who are not sure that they can turn to someone next to them and say, ha ha ha, we're committing a felony here. And I, I really think this idea of lifting up that in some sense, the attacks aren't just isolating the pregnant people. They're also isolating, chilling, and taking away support from the people who provide essential care. That feels like it's a through line. Is that kind of, am I right about that? Yes. I mean, I never want to not center the experiences of the pregnant person because they are certainly the one that is going through the most trauma here. But what the providers are going through is also a trauma. And so the series in some ways I think of as sort of a love letter to my community and saying, I see you and this is hard and you're doing a great job. And I think the other personally biggest goal for me of the series is to just inspire action and inspire advocacy. And I think there are some people for whom the voices of the pregnant patients and the stories of the pregnant patients are enough. And there are some people that sort of ignore those stories. And maybe these stories from medical providers will be sort of a different lens and a different angle to think about it and make people think about it in ways that they hadn't before. And just sort of realize the importance in a new way, maybe that hadn't hadn't quite touched them before. Because I think, like you're saying, you know, the pendulum has swung so far to the right on abortion and is still swinging to the right. And they don't want it to stop swinging to the right until we have a federal ban on abortion and all sorts of other draconian things. But we can get it to swing back to the left. And I believe that it will at some point, but it's going to take a lot of action, a lot of coordinated action. You know, what we talk about is that The right spent 50 years doing this really methodically, really carefully building this basically ever since the day that Roe went into effect, and it worked. And that's kind of what we have to do now. And it's a long slog, and it's a lot of hard work. But my hope with this series is that it's just another thing, again, among 
an enormous amount of advocacy and activism and journalism that's already being done, just another kind of piece of that puzzle to hopefully inspire people to care a little bit more about this issue and do whatever one more thing they feel like they can do. Allison Block is executive producer and host of Post Row America from The Nocturnist. Allie is a family doctor, abortion provider, and assistant professor of family medicine at Brown University. Allie, I thank you so, so much for the work you're doing and the stories you are surfacing. Congratulations and thank you for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. It really meant a lot. Um, and if anybody wants to check out the series, they can find it at thenocturnist.com or anywhere you get your podcasts at The Nocturnist Post Row America. And that is a wrap for this episode of Amicus. Thank you so much for listening in, and thank you so much for your letters and questions. You can always keep in touch at amicus at slate.com. Or you can find us at facebook.com slash amicus podcast. Today's show was produced by Sarah Burningham. Alicia Montgomery is vice president of audio at Slate. And Ben Richmond is our senior director of operations. We'll be back with another episode of Amicus in two short weeks. Until then, take good care. <laughs>